this is the Sunday after Ascension, so that's, what, that's our subject for today. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, as we consider this uh, matter, we pray for your Holy Spirit to increase our faith as we look into these things. May we grasp them, we pray, in your mercy and grace, and to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's the Sunday after Ascension today. The Ascension is a fantastic festival. Really, it's the successful conclusion of all the terrible work which Jesus was called on, that burden which he was called on to bear. And he successfully completed this. So um, the ascension marks the end of that and, and the completion of it. This is no academic uh, celebration. It, it, it concerns each one of us in our day. You see, before uh, the work which Jesus did, access to God was extremely limited. God was only at work in a small group of people, the Jews, how old of God to choose the Jews, goes the jingle. Why did he choose them? Specifically because we are told they were small and uh, insignificant. So that's where, but even amongst them, access to God was limited. You could only reach God through the priests and with very particular offerings. And even the high priest, in all his glory, was, could only go into the holiest of holies once a year, and that with very particular offerings. He had to be very careful, because if he got it wrong, he would drop dead. You did not go into the presence of God on your own terms. And Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, died just because of that. They offered strange fire. They got the order, and they did what they wanted to do, basically. They were careless. And Aaron wasn't allowed to mourn their passing. He did have two other, other sons, but those two died. So access to God was very, very limited. But now you see, as a result of this work which Jesus has done, this is a very great triumph, because now the kingdom of heaven is open to all believers. A tremendous door was opened, so that anyone may walk into the temple, into the presence of God and know him. And you see, you and I are the direct beneficiaries of that. This is the sole reason why we've been born again and filled with the Holy Spirit and can live in the presence of God and know that when we die, we shall enter the city of God. So this is a fantastic triumph. And really the ascension of uh, Jesus is the conclusion of that. When Jesus enters heaven, there is a fantastic party. There was when he was born. You know, uh, in pubs sometimes the party spills out into the street and gets so exuberant. Well, when Jesus was born, it spilled out into the street so that the shepherds who were on the mountains minding their own business saw this uh, glorious scene of the angels and they went to uh, Bethlehem. We're not told that this party spilled over, but maybe it did. But anyway, I want to read you this comment, well, this voice in heaven, when Jesus is welcomed into the heavenlies, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. You see, when Jesus returns to the heavens, as he says in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Half an hour silence while we think about that. That's an astonishing thing to say. Supposing I said that to you, you'd think I was completely crackers. And you see, right. But that's what Jesus said. In his case, we know that he's not practice because he is God in God. All authority is given to him. Uh, and all the royal power and glory which he put down when he came to earth is now restored to him. He, he dwells in glorious majesty and effulgent splendor at the right hand of the Father in the heavens. So, the ascension, uh, Jesus must have longed for that time, and that's now where he is, enthroned on high. Um, 
So I just want to look at the, the last few uh, months of Jesus' ministry. It seems to me that it started really with the transfiguration. You remember the story? Jesus ascends the mountain, we're not told which mountain it was, with uh, one or two of his disciples. He, descend, he ascends this mountain and at the top, he, he, his um, clothing becomes shining white and the glory of God comes down upon him. And the pillar of cloud, which followed Moses and the people of Israel in the wilderness for 40 years, comes and envelops them all. The disciples don't know what on earth to do. So before then, Jesus lived the, well, I was going to say ordinary life of a perfect man before God. He uh, ate and drank, he slept and woke up, he walked and talked, just like us, you know, walking through life. But after that, after the transfiguration, when he came down from the mountain, he set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem and to face the, his purpose as the Redeemer. And the things which he did, we can't relate to. We could before, but we can't really relate to, to what happened afterwards. For example, the Garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus looks into the fathomless depths of man's rebellion against God and considers being made bearing that burden himself, being made to be sin and pay the price for it. As he looked into it, remember, he hated sin, God hates sin. As he looked into it, he was nearly overcome by, by it. He sweated great drops of blood. However, he accepts this call, not my will, but thine be done, he says. Uh, we can't go there, can we? That's completely beyond anything which we should experience. Then there was the cross. The crucifixion. The cross is one of the most bestial deaths ever invented by man. I think it was invented by the Carthaginians, I'm not sure. They were a pretty violent crew. And it was taken up by the Romans. But not just the death on the cross, but the whole business of being the sin bearer and paying the price of sin, which is death. That's why we die, because of sin. And that separation which he endured from the Father. Once again, we can't possibly go there. Then descent into hell, where he explored, the Bible tells us, all the regions of that land of darkness. Well, we can't, we hope not to go there. We're not going there. We belong to Christ. Then the resurrection, and then the ascension into the heavens. Um, so, so that was after the transfiguration, but before the, the transfiguration, as I said, Jesus lives the, well, the ordinary life of a man before God. As we know, Jesus was without original sin, which means there was no desire in him whatsoever to do what he wanted to do. His heart was simply to do what God wanted him to do. Um, when we say he was without sin, we mean that he was the second person after Adam and Eve to be created without sin. So whereas Adam is head of the human race, the Bible tells us, Jesus is the second federal head of the human race, in that there was no original sin there. But we're told that Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are. So all through his life, in a thousand and one ways, Every day, Jesus faced this choice. Are you going to do what you want to do, or are you going to do what God wants you to do? An example of this is uh, when Satan approached him in the wilderness, and amongst other things, he <coughs> said, look, you're the Messiah, okay? I can give you all the kingdoms of this world and their glory, because they belong to me. I'm the God of this world. I can give them to you if you'll bow down and worship me. Why not take this shortcut? Why not? Why go to the cross? That terrible thing. Who says you're going to succeed anyway? Take a shortcut. But Jesus says no. All the way through then, in so many ways, Jesus was called to say no. So the flesh, which was soaked in 
sin for hundreds of years. Jesus is driving a rebellion out of it and uh, righteousness into it. And we're told that he learned obedience with suffering. I'm not quite sure what that means. Other than that as he was confronted day by day with temptation to sin, he, as someone who was without sin and who hated it, he found this such an arduous um, task. Day after day, year after year, he was called to do this. But he succeeded. And as, as he made these decisions, so he drew the flesh nearer and nearer to himself and to God. Until on the mountain of transfiguration, he is transfigured before them. His, he, the, the light and glory of God shines in his flesh. Incidentally, um, it just shows us that our flesh is co coherent and consistent with the things of God. We're not dealing with some, you know, far away, distant impossibility. Moses, when he came down from the mountain, the glory of God shone in his face. You know, so there's a, a symbiosis between the flesh and the spirit. And can I remind you um, that this gives us a hint of what happened at the beginning of time when God created men and women and he saw that it was good because it was good, because God is good, because God doesn't create anything inconsistent with his holy nature. So he didn't create this mess up. When God created the world there was no sin and no death. But this is not our permanent home. So what was mankind supposed to do? Well, mankind was created with free will, of course. We know that Adam and Eve had a free choice. Um, because God didn't want to create robots who would automatically do what he wanted them to do. On the contrary, he wanted to have a loving relationship which depends on free choice. So mankind, in the flesh, which was neutral, through many moral decisions, uh, would draw the flesh nearer and nearer to God and cement that relationship until finally the glory of God filled him and then he could step into the city of God, his apprenticeship over and he would be fit then for the place and the work which he was called to do in the city of God. So here, returning to the transfiguration, here is Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, filled with light and glory. He could have stepped into the heavens at that time, because he'd completed 33 years of struggle with sin and won. He could have done that and just said, cheerio to the disciples. Bye bye. But then you see, no work of redemption would have been done. The price of sin would not have been paid. And all we could do was just look at this very good example. The best way to live, the best way to live before God. But it would have been a terrible accusation because we can't live like that because of sin. And so it was simply a reinforced the condemnation which we are naturally under as those with original sin. But Jesus didn't do that. He came down from the mountain and set his face to go to Jerusalem. But then we come to the, trans to the uh, ascension, which is a kind of a parallel, really, on another mountain. We don't know which mountain the transfiguration was on, but we do know that the ascension was on Mount Olivet. And remember that Moses and Elijah, who appeared on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration, weren't talking to Jesus about heaven. They were talking to him about his death. So he comes down from the mountain, but on the Mount of um, Transfiguration, he ascends into the heavenlies because the work is done. So when he waves goodbye to the um, disciples, that's the last they see of him with the nail prints in his hands. The victory is won, you see. So this is a fantastic victory. The kingdom of heaven is open to all believers. We may live in the presence of God, and we shall remember next week that in ascending to heaven, he sent down the power of the Holy Spirit to uh, enable us. Okay, that's the end of the introduction. This is the sermon. <laughs> I, I want to just leave you with these thoughts. You see, this is not an academic matter. It's not a theological, a theological, a 
distraction. This is a real victory. But in the church these days, we're not really living in that victory, it seems to me. Now, don't get me wrong. The presence of God is here. And uh, we are aware of the hand of God upon us. But the church at large these days is not living in the kind of victory which is demonstrated when the first ch when the church first started. Uh, churches and chapels are closing these days. A number of dioceses are on the verge of bankruptcy, and as we know, that society becomes more and more secular and taking on board non-Christian morals and standards. And God simply isn't on people's radar. However, the victory is won. We should not be at the bottom, but we should be leading people to God in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus gave the disciples a good piece of advice. And maybe they were tempted, having waved him off to heaven, to rush off and say, look what we found. But he said, you're not to do that. Wait, as you heard in the reading which Jenny read, wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. When I was in my teens, we lived in a village in Devon, and there was a large uh, woolen mill factory there, Victorian factory, lots of floors. My father was invited to look round him, I don't know why, and I went with him again, I don't know why, I'm not particularly interested in wool making, but anyway, we went to this large factory, and we, it, it was very impressive. Uh, lots of floors, absolutely full of machinery, and up in the ceiling there were uh, wheels turning and belts driving these wheels, all silent, and lots of people standing around attending to the machines on each floor. The wool came at this end, wool, untreated wool came in at this end, and then the yarn in beautiful bright colours came out the other end, Fox's woolen mill it was called. But what we did not see was the, where the power came from. Never even thought about it really. It was all turning, the belts were turning silently, but we didn't know where the power came from. We weren't sure. I don't know why. Years afterwards, I learned that that factory was driven by an enormous and impressive steam beam engine. My goodness, I would love to have seen that. <laughs> now, now, that would have interested me much more than the. <laughs> but it seems to me that the church is like that. Everything's turning, uh, lots of people are doing stuff, attending everything, everything is done. But we're not really attending to the engine room. The engine room is the Holy Spirit. We need to seek the Holy <coughs> Spirit. Jesus uh, called the disciples to do that, and that's what they did. The story of Elijah and Elijah comes to mind. Elijah was coming to the end of his ministry. And his apprentice, Elisha, knew that and wanted a double portion of his anointing. That's what Elisha said to Elijah. And Elijah said, oh, well, that's quite difficult, really. You have to see me when I go. So Elisha stuck to him like glue. Elijah said, I'm going down to Dothan. You stay here. No, no, I'm coming with you. Uh, I'm going down to Jericho. You stay here. No, I'm coming with you. That happened four times, and Elisha flatly refused to leave Elijah because he wanted to receive the anointing. And sure enough, when Elijah was carried up to heaven in a whirlwind, his cloak fell off him, Elisha put it off and moved in the power of the Spirit which had been upon Elisha. Let us stick to these things like glue. Let us seek God for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I'm glad that these things are on our hearts, and as we prayed this morning, as Sue led us, for a move of God, for revival in our church, for, for the victory of Christ to be manifested through us uh, in all that we do, to the glory of his name, not us. Uh, Jesus gives some advice in John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, obey me, and I will send the Holy Spirit. 
Obedience is a very important matter. And I'm, I'm determined to concentrate on this one. In a thousand and one ways, every day, we have choices to make. Do we please ourselves or, we, or do we please God? I'm not suggesting that when you open your drawer in the morning, you spend half an hour praying for guidance as to which church you're going to put on. But you know what I mean. I'm, I'm determined for myself to take this more seriously. I, I can't say I, I wasn't serious about it, but it, 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 it's so easy just to get involved in all the wheels turning and the machinery. You know, you just you just carry on because you're you're focused on the things which need to be done, which is fair enough. But above all, let us seek God that his anointing might be upon us. And as you look at that picture, remember, the Holy Spirit is poured out. Poured, that's a very generous word. It's not dripped or dribbled or, or whatever. It's poured out. He, sorry, not it. We refer to the Holy Spirit as it. The Holy Spirit is he, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We think a lot about Jesus and about the Father. Let's also remember the Holy Spirit, who is a part of the Godhead. And you and I can have as much of the Holy Spirit as we want. Why did the disciples have to wait? Not because the Holy Spirit, there was a strike in heaven, and they weren't going to pour it out just now, until they got more money. I suggest it was because work needed to be done by the disciples to line up. So... May God grant us that heart's desire to uh, say no to pride, to die to self, so that we may rise to Christ. Amen. Amen.